Well, we're going to uh, proceed with the next um, uh, lecture, and it's me this time. Uh, my name is Morris Leeson. I am Education Ambassador with the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, and um, I run various surname projects. I've been involved in DNA for quite a while, ever since I became addicted back in 2009. And I'm going to talk to you today about finding long-lost family with DNA. And uh, we've heard about the, uh, the human side of the story from Julia's presentation about Anthea Ring. I'm going to focus more on the kind of techniques that you can use to um, find a foundling or an adoptee within your own family. So there are a variety of different brick walls that we have on our family tree. These are mine. This is an Irish family tree. You can see that Irish records tend to peter out around about 1830, 1800. And uh, at that point in time, I have my brick wall. But I have been able to break through it using Y-DNA on my Spiran line and using autosomal DNA on my Morgan line. Uh, the Spiran line takes me back to London in the 1600s, uh, uh, Flanders in the 1500s, and um, on the Morgan side, it takes me back to somebody called Noah, who built a very large boat. Um, but I'm a supposedly the 10th cousin of Princess Diana. I'm related to J.P. Morgan. I'm related to Captain Morgan Rum. So now I drink it out of familial duty. Um, so it does take you on wonderful adventures. But for a lot of people, their brick walls are a lot further down the family tree. So your grandfather might have run away to the circus, and all you know about him is that his name was John Smith, and he came from London. Well, good luck with that. Um, on the other hand, you might have a, a grandmother who was a foundling, just like Anthea Ring was a foundling, and you don't know anything about her parents at all. It may be that your father was illegitimate, and that you know who his mother was, but you don't actually know who the father was, and you're missing that side of the family tree, and if you were a foundling or if you were illegally adopted and your um, adoption papers were forged, your birth and baptism records were forged, then you might know nothing about your father's side of the family or your mother's side of the family. So we all have this variety of brick walls in our family trees, and DNA can help us break through those brick walls. How many people have a foundling or an adop adoption in their family trees? It's usually about 50% of the audience, and we're getting close to about 50% there. Well, there are three main types of DNA. You probably know this already, so I'm just running through this. Uh, y DNA only goes back along your father, father, father line. So if you go back 10 generations, you have about 1,000 ancestors. Y DNA is only going to tell you about one of those 1,000 ancestors and won't tell you anything about the remaining 999. Similarly, on the other side of your family tree, your mother's 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 side, that can be tracked back using mitochondrial DNA. But again, if you go back 10 generations, it's telling you about one of your ancestors and nothing about the other 999 that you have at that particular generational level. So the main test that we use is the autosomal DNA test. It looks at all of your DNA, all of your chromosomes, uh, but it has a very limited reach. It only goes back reliably about five, six, or seven generations. But it is the most um, reliable, the most widely used test for uh, genealogy in general and for this type of foundling and adoptee work in particular. Um, the Y DNA can identify your, the, birth, the surname of your birth father. And we saw this um, earlier on uh, with one of the speakers where there was a very clear signal for a particular surname among the matches of this person's Y DNA. Um, on the other side, mitochondrial DNA is not much good for adoptee cases, and I only use it in very specific circumstances. So it's really autosomal DNA that we'll be focusing on in this presentation. Now, the recommended strategy for testing is to do the ancestry DNA test first, then download a copy of the results when they come back from the lab, and upload a copy of the results to Family Tree DNA, My Heritage, Living DNA, and GEDmatch. And if you don't find the answer there, then you can test uh, with 23andMe. And between them, there's over 30 million people who are in these databases. And the biggest one is going to be Ancestry, with roughly about 17 million people in that particular database. 
If you're paranoid about privacy, and a lot of people are concerned about privacy, everybody should be, there are certain things that you can do, such as don't do the test in the first place. If you are a multi-billionaire, and in your student days you were a sperm donor, don't do a DNA test. Your 500 children will find you, and they'll want a piece of the pie. Ask your brother to do the test instead. Now, that's not going to really help you that much if you're a billionaire, uh, because they're still going to find you through your brother. But if, you have, uh, if your brother has less concerns about it than you do, then get him uh, or your sister to do the test instead. Use a false name. Use a nickname. Use initials. Use something that cannot be traced back to you. Another option would be to use a specific unidentifiable email address that, again, cannot be traced back to you. Um, you can privatize your results so that nobody can see them, and you can unprivatize them when you're working on them, and then reprivatize them when you're not. And that also is another way of maintaining your privacy. Um, you also can make your online private trees private and unsearchable as well. Because if they just have your DNA, there's, there's no way of linking it to you unless they have some information about your family tree. So keeping your family tree private is another way of um, optimizing your privacy. And then, of course, you can delete your kit and destroy your sample at any point in time by simply writing to the company and asking them to do so. So that's privacy for the paranoid. If you do decide to do a DNA test to try and find long-lost family, be prepared for an instant connection. This is Winnie, my good friend Winnie, who contacted me four years ago. And um, her YouTube is on video. You can simply search for it by looking at, by Googling YouTube, 23andMe, 76-year-old adoptee. And you'll find this wonderful five-minute video uh, that we don't have time to show, unfortunately. <coughs> but she was 75, had been adopted. She was raised with nine kids. Four of them were natural children. Five of them were adopted. She always felt different. She'd been searching for 35 years, but she had waited until her adoptive mother had passed away because she didn't want to offend or cause any kind of hurt to her adoptive mother. And that's very, very common with adoptees. They don't start the search until their adoptive parents have passed away. But after 35 years of searching, she found that a lot of the non-identifying information that she had was wrong. Um, and so she turned to DNA. And she tested with Family Tree DNA back in 2010. And uh, when she wrote to me in 2014, I said, have you done a DNA test? She said, yes, family tree DNA. She says, but I don't understand it at all. I've got third cousins, fourth cousins, fifth cousins. I don't know how they're connected to me, and they don't know, and, and they don't know how they're connected to me. So um, it's all a bit of a confusion. So I said, fine. Test with the other two major companies, Ancestry, 23andMe. I'm off to the Caribbean on my holidays. Drop me an email when I get back. So I went off to the sun. And then six weeks later, I'd forgotten about it completely, but I got an email from Winnie. And Winnie said, um, oh, my results are back, and you won't believe it, but I have a first cousin match on 23andMe. And I was like, well, OK, time out, time out. You need, you're very, very close to finding the answer. You need to write a long letter. You need to go to bed. And when you get up in the morning, you need to rewrite the whole thing. And she said, but we're already connected on Facebook, and we've swapped photographs, and the family <laughs> resemblance is amazing. I said, OK, well, forget what I said. And she said, but I don't think he is my first cousin. So I said, well, why not? Well, she said, he's 35, I'm 75, so he's probably the son of my first cousin. And I said, yes, that probably makes sense, but se send me your DNA. Let me look at your DNA results, and let, let me see if I can find anything. So she had tested. This was in January 2015. And her first cousin was a chap called Nathaniel, Nate. And we didn't know whether it was on the maternal or paternal side. So just putting it into the family tree, it would look something like this. It could be on Winnie's mother's side or a first cousin on Winnie's father's side. But if Nathaniel was uh, the son of a first cousin, then it would look something like that. So that was the kind of um, structure that I was expecting to see in the family tree. So if he was a first cousin once removed, I'd expect them to share about six and a quarter percent of their DNA in common, and that translates into 248 to 638 centimorgans, with an average of around about 440. But Nathaniel shared 9.77%, which was way outside the range that we had been observed, observing for first cousins once removed. And then it suddenly hit me. 
Both of them had been thinking he was the son of her first cousin. That was wrong. He wasn't the son of her first cousin. He was the son of a half-sibling, because that would share exactly the same amount of DNA that you'd get with first cousins, roughly about 12.5% or about 880 centimorgans. So I spoke to several people and I said, am I, am, I, am I interpreting this correctly or what? And they said, yes, that, that is the most likely explanation. So I wrote to both of them, who were still swapping photographs on Facebook, and I said, I hope you're both sitting down, because, Nate, you're not the son of a first cousin, you're a son of a half-sibling. Well, they fell off their chairs, and so um, it was decided... Well, I looked... I also found that there was an X match between Nate and Winnie, and the only way that Nathaniel could get an X chromosome would be if it was his mother that was the half-sibling in question. So now we knew it was actually Nathaniel's mother that was the half-sibling rather than Nathaniel's father. I also looked at mitochondrial DNA, and Nathaniel and Winnie shared the same mitochondrial DNA haplogroup, which meant that Winnie's uh, mother could also have been Nathaniel's mother's mother, and that's how the mitochondrial DNA passed down along the direct female line. Now, there was a chance that Winnie's autosomal DNA came from her father, and the mitochondrial DNA that Nate had was from Winnie's father's second partner, who just happened to be the same mitochondrial haplogroup as Winnie, because it might have been very common in the general population. So to look at that, I looked at Winnie's uh, matches and how many of them actually had this mitochondrial DNA haplogroup H11A2. Only six out of 925 so that meant the second scenario, the chances of that happening were less than 1%. So I was able to tell all of this just from looking at Winnie's DNA. So I wrote back to them and I said, Nate, you need to test your mother. He tested his mother. And Winnie wrote, wrote to me and said, I am on pins and needles awaiting her results. There have been so many disappointments at dead ends in my 35 years of searching, I'm afraid to be too hopeful that his mum is truly my half-sister. The last few days have been such an emotional roller coaster. I think I've run out of tears of joy. So that's what Winnie wrote. And then six weeks later, the results came back. 25% match between Nathaniel's mother and Winnie, exactly at what you'd expect to find for a half-sister. So then Winnie writes to me, the last few days have been overwhelmingly wonderful. I've had long conversations with my newly found half-siblings. We've exchanged more photographs. They say that the resemblance between our shared mother and me is striking. It is just amazing how this family, who a month ago had no idea that I existed, has embraced me with such love and grace, despite having to absorb the shocking news about how we are related. I am so very, very lucky. So this was a wonderful reunion, and I guarantee you, if I showed you that video, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house. But I didn't bring Kleenex with me, so I'm not going to put you through it. So that was Winnie's story. And of course, Nathaniel had been in the database waiting for her to find him for the last 18 months. So you never know in which da database the big fish is swimming. And that's why you really have to have a presence in all of them. So, that was instant connection, but for most of us, we have to do a little bit of work. And this is the kind of methodological approach I take to finding uh, birth families of adoptees, of foundlings. So even if it was your grandmother or your grandfather that, that uh, was the foundling, you can still use this technique to break through that brick wall in your family tree. And it really involves three steps. Step one, triangulate back. Step two, trace forward. Step three, confirm the target with targeted testing. So let's look at all three of these steps. And the first step, triangulate back. Uh, this is really three stages. Are there any close matches? Which ones match each other? Can you triangulate on a common ancestor? So if you look at your uh, list of DNA matches, and here's John's DNA matches, and he's got two second cousins and four third cousins and a couple of fourth cousins, and underneath, you can see where the actual amount of DNA is, is written. I've actually made it uh, bigger in this column on the right. And the thing is, you don't know which ancestral line these people are connected to you on. Um, uh, a very useful tool is Johnny Pearl's shared Centimorgan project tool. Um, you simply put the amount of DNA into the box. So if it's 200 and 
108 or 157, you put it into the box, and it gives you an automatically gives you an, uh, a list of, of relationship probabilities. And you can see that they're, they're divided into bundles. Um, this first bundle, uh, the most common relationship in this first bundle is the second cousin once removed. In the second bundle, it's the second cousin is the most common. And in the third bundle, it's the third cousin. But uh, for, for the given amount of DNA, 157, uh, there's a 53% chance it's one of these relationships in the first bundle. And my money is always going to be on the, the most common, which is a second cousin once removed. You can see there's a 26% chance it could be a second cousin and a 14% chance it could be a third cousin. So it's a very useful tool for, again, trying to get that picture in your mind about where do you sit in relation to each other in the larger family tree. The second step is which ones, which of your close matches match each other? And here, for example, is um, the ancestry DNA results of D. Now, D has four second cousins. Uh, a, a blue second cousin match, a purple second cousin match, a green one, and a red one. Well, if we click on the, the blue one and view this match, and then click on the shared matches tab, the red cousin comes up. So what this tells us is that we, but we I match, or D matches the blue cousin and the red cousin, but they also match each other. And the implication there is that if these two cousins match each other, and as it turns out, they are second cousins to each other as well, it means that they go back to a, a common set of great-grandparents, and by implication, because you also are second cousins to each of them, you go back to the same shared ancestral couple, uh, a pair of great-grandparents. And then all you have to do is compare family trees. This is the family tree of the blue second cousin match. This is the family tree of the red second cousin match. And if you look really carefully, you can find that at that great-grandparental level, there are people in common in both trees. The same ancestors appear in both trees. Michael Rooney and Mary Walsh turn out to be the common great-grandparents of the blue second cousin and the red second cousin, and by implication, your great-grandparents too. So that is uh, what triangulation is all about. You're triangulating back onto a set of common ancestors. The second part of this implication is that if these people are your great-grandparents, one of their grandchildren is going to be your birth mother or your birth father. So now all you have to do is trace down from that set of ancestors, looking at all of their descendants, and let's hope they didn't have 11 children who had 11 children who had 11 children, uh, in the knowledge that one of those descendants will be your birth mother or your birth father. And that's the technique in a nutshell. Now, for, that's what we do with adoptees, but how many people have a grandmother that was adopted or a foundling or a parent that was a foundling? So it's going to, we're going to have to adapt the technique slightly for that particular situation. Because in that situation, you know, let's assume that, a, that your grandmother was a foundling. You will know three of your four sets of great-grandparents, but you won't know who your grandmother's parents were. So there's going to be a mystery set, a mystery pair of great-grandparents. And what you do in this case is you um, identify all of the matches that descend from uh, couple one, couple two, and couple three, and any of the matches remaining have to be from couple four, which is your mystery pair of great-grandparents. And there's various ways that you can do this. And Ancestry recently introdu introduced their colored buttons feature uh, which you can find under the Extras tab, and then um, down here, click on Ancestry Lab. And this allows you to sort your matches by common ancestor. So for example, here are my uh, dad's matches um, uh, at the third and fourth cousin level. And I've put in some colored dots. The pink one is uh, maternal, and the blue one is paternal. So I'm able to divide his matches into paternal and maternal matches. But also, I'm able to go one step further, and if I click on this, you'll see that the pink dot is uh, DNA that has come down to, to him via his great-grandparents, Joseph O'Carroll and Maria Jane Dockery. The blue one uh, represents matches 
uh, who share DNA that has come down to him via his great-grandparents, John Gleason and Anne Gleason. And the last one, the dark red one, is, uh, indicates a match to my dad, um, the DNA of which has come down to him via his ancestors, Patrick Spearin and Mary Morgan. So this is a great way of just isolating your matches um, and uh, eliminating the ones that are not relevant to the mystery uh, great-grandparental couple that you want to find the names of. Um, here is, again, a set of matches, because once you've done this colored buttons and assigned colored buttons to all your top matches, you can click on all matches and then filter them by a specific ancestor. So if I click on Joseph O'Carroll, these are all of the matches that I know are descended uh, from Joseph O'Carroll. Anyone who matches them is also likely to have, um, uh, to, to be related in some way to Joseph O'Carroll. Uh, they may be second cousins to this person, or they may be, uh, they may descend from Joseph O'Carroll, or it could be from his parent, or his grandparent, or his great-grandparent. All I know is that the DNA that's come down to dad has come via Joseph O'Carroll, so it isolates that part of the family tree to do further research. <clears throat> now, a very um, useful tool that's come on uh, recently as well is the auto-clustering tool. And this was developed by Everett-Jan Blom uh, at the Genetic Affairs website. And watch this uh, diagram here. You've seen it in an earlier presentation, but uh, what it does is it clusters your matches into groups of shared matches. And the idea is that each cluster of shared matches descends from a common ancestor. And you will have DNA from one of the descendants of that common ancestor, and it helps focus your research. Uh, you'll know that, say, people in cluster one, they are all related to my father via his ancestor, Joseph O'Carroll. So the DNA that's come down to my dad for the, uh, from Joseph O'Carroll is DNA also that came down from the common ancestor to cluster one. So it's a great way of organizing your matches into these different clusters. Um, now, on genetic affairs, you can do this for your 23andMe matches, your family tree DNA matches, your ancestry DNA matches, but it has been in integrated as a tool on the MyHeritage website. So now, if you are um, a customer with MyHeritage, you can actually use this tool for free on the MyHeritage website. And also, a little birdie has told me it is coming to GEDmatch soon. So watch out for this on GEDmatch in the very, very near uh, future. So that's another great way of clustering and organizing your matches into clusters, and that helps you focus on the uh, matches that are maybe related to you via your mystery great-grandparents. So once you've clustered people into groups of shared matches, the next question is, can you triangulate on a common ancestor? And in order to do this, you need to have the family trees of your matches. If you don't have the family trees of your matches, then you're stuck. You're at the same roadblock you were at beforehand. And you need to find a family tree for each of your matches. But some people don't have any family tree. Some people have a family tree that's only partially filled out. Some people have a full family tree. Some people have a family tree with one side of the family completely incorrect. And some people have uh, sparse family trees that contain a lot of inaccuracies. So you do have to be very, very uh, careful comparing uh, trees. The theory is that all members of a cluster of shared matches have a common ancestor. The caveats are, a lot of the time, people have double connections in their family tree. How many people have cousins marrying cousins in their family tree? OK, that's at least 50% of the audience. And that throws a spanner in the works. There also may be half-cousins from a second marriage, or there could be a non-paternity event, uh, a secret adoption, or an illegitimacy further back in the line. But if you do manage to compare family trees, again, what you're looking for and hoping for is that you find a common ancestor in the family tree of, of uh, at least two of your matches, preferably three or four of them. And then once you find that common ancestor, then you exchange information with your match, collaborate, share genealogical information, 
hopefully break through that brick wall and push your family tree back an extra generation on that particular ancestral line, maybe two, three, or even more. So that's the theory. I'm introducing two important concepts, the concept of the red herring and the concept of the spanner in the works. The red herring is things like inaccurate family trees, or you've put the wrong John Smith in your family tree and everything above that is totally wrong, or there's false positive DNA matches. And that's only really a, a problem if you get down to 10 centimorgan segments or less. Be very, very careful about using 10 centimorgan segments. I usually don't use them at all. It usually indicates that it's a very distant relative, but it could also be a false positive. So you don't want false positives sending you down the rabbit hole. The spanner in the works are when you don't get any response to inquiries. One of the adoptees I was working with got a first cousin match in her matches, and she wrote to the first cousin, and the first cousin did write back. She said, can't help you, I'm adopted too. So again, you're at that brick wall. Um, no family tree available. Oh, I only wanted to see if I was more Irish than my brother, and I am, yay. Um, that's not any help to you. Um, if there's a generation gap, that's very, very confusing for people. You can get a gap, a generation gap of 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and that can really screw up your uh, thinking. A second connection we've talked about, um, that happens when you, your ancestors came from a very uh, rural, isolated rural community, which is, uh, well, Ireland, actually. Um, lots of places in Ireland are small, isolated rural communities, and you get cousins marrying cousins, and you oh, he's my second cousin on my mother's side, and my third cousin on my father's side, and he's my fourth cousin on some other side. Um, and then the half relationship, we've mentioned that as well, and adoptions and illegitimacies. Expect the unexpected in this line of work. There's usually a twist in the tale, and sometimes there's two. So um, you might be thinking in this direction, and you find yourself having to go in that direction. Both the red herring and the spanner in the works can lead you on a wild goose chase. But how many people in the audience spotted that this was a wild swan chase? And that's just another example of how you can be misled into thinking down a certain line when in actual fact it's something completely different. So in the ideal situation, if you're a foundling or an adoptee, you want to identify all four sets of great-grandparents. And uh, that, for that, you'll need at least two second cousins uh, triangulating back on each of these sets of great-grandparents. And we'll call them A, B, C, and D, but when you actually identify them, you don't know which is which. You don't know if A married D, or A married B, or A married C. That comes later. But I, in the ideal situation, you'll have enough clusters of shared matches that you'll be able to triangulate on all four of your great-grandparents. You will ultimately hit a brick wall, and certainly with Irish research, um, that happens around about the 1800 time point, which means that I can only really work with second and third cousins. Anything beyond third cousins, I can't find the records to, to actually make that documentary connection. Um, also, this aspect of the work is so time-consuming. You can throw tens, hundreds, or even thousands of hours uh, trying to tr uh, be, tr be, build trees back that will actually triangulate. It's very, very time-consuming. So that's the first step, is triangulating back onto a set of common ancestors, uh, Mr. Common Ancestor and Mrs. Common Ancestor. Because we presume that, you know, your great-grandparents married each other, rather than having an affair with the, the milkman, which sometimes happens as well, or having a second uh, marriage, uh, which can also throw a, a spanner in the works. Step two is tracing forward, and this is where we build the trees forward from the common ancestor down to the present day. So it's reverse genealogy in a way. Most genealogy is going back, back, back in time. Now we're reversing it and we're coming forward in time. You want to identify all the children of all the children of all the children. Um, ultimately, as an adoptee, you will have to tell your story. And you'll have to tell your matches, actually, I'm adopted, and here's my story. And then you'll also have to make very cautious inquiries with um, close family, potentially close family members. So building the tree forward is very time consuming the further back your common ancestor is. We've talked about great grandparents. Supposing it's great great, you've doubled your work, if not quadrupled it. And if you go back an extra generation, you've quadrupled that as well. So it can be extremely time consuming. 
And of course, the more children that you find at each descendant level that are there, the more work is that's created because you have to find the children of the next generation level down. What I always hope for is that the common ancestors had one child, which had one child, which had one child. Bingo! There we go. Found it. But usually, um, it's five children, ten children. The most I've seen is 17 children. Um, so that was a very young marriage that went on for a long time. Ancestry is the easiest website to use because you've got access to other people's trees. And that's what makes it really, really useful if somebody's done the work for you. It's also a very useful a sense check on your own research. Ancestry also have a, a wealth of records that you can use to check the accuracy of other people's trees as well. You can also contact the tree owners and ask them questions. You can create your own tree as a private, unsearchable um, draft family tree, experimental family tree. Uh, you don't really want anybody looking into it because they'll just copy all your inaccuracies over to other family trees. So keep it private, keep it unsearchable. You'll always be hounded by this question, is your tree accurate? Because a lot of the time, if you're working with adoptees, you're, and it's not your family, you don't know the intimate details of family lore that could be very, very useful in confirming a record that you want to put into the tree. So tracing forward until the trees intersect, what you might f find here is that uh, great-grandparents see, if you look at their children, you find that one of their children married one of the children of great-grandparents B. And that way, you find that there are intersecting families. And that brings them together, and that helps you to identify the grandparents of the adoptee or the foundling. Uh, now, the next step, of course, is to find the children. Because if you've identified the grandparents, then the grandparents on your father's side, grandparents on your mother's side, one of the children of the grandparents on each side is going to be your birth mother or your birth father. At this stage, you still don't know. If you have identified your birth mother, for example, and you're only looking for your birth father, and you found the grandparents, and there are only two children, and one was a boy and one was a girl, then you know it has to be the boy. That makes it easy. You can eliminate the girl because she's the wrong gender. But supposing you don't know whether it's the boys or the girls, and you know that, yes, one of the, my birth parents belongs to this family, it's one of these children, but how many children do they have? They had 11 children. So now, how do you prove which one of those 11 children was your birth parent? Well, this is where you could use mitochondrial DNA to separate the boys from the girls. Because if you can find a direct female line to that family and down to yourself, then if the mitochondrial DNA is an exact match, it has to be one of the women. Because only the women pass on mitochondrial DNA, and you're looking at your birth mother. If there isn't a match, then you're looking at your birth father. You can also use xDNA in a very similar way. If you're a boy, you can only have got xDNA from your mother. So if there's a strong xDNA match with the people in this family, then it has to be on your mother's side. It cannot be on your father's side. So that's when xDNA and mitochondrial DNA come in handy. But eventually, you will have to approach the birth family. Because even if you find out at your birth mother, if there were five girls and six boys, you still have five girls left that could potentially be the birth mother. And that might mean testing every single one of those five um, um, potential candidates. And this is where revealing the full story becomes very important. Because up till now, uh, certainly the work that I do with adoptees and foundlings, I usually say I'm helping Jane with her family tree, keeping the privacy of the adoptee in mind as well as the privacy of her matches. I mention that she's adopted if they ask me directly. Don't tell any lies. Don't try and conceal anything because that destroys trust, and you need to have a trusting relationship. You also have to clear it with the adoptee. How much of your story are you happy for me to tell to complete strangers who happen to turn up in your list of matches? So that's a very important conversation that needs to happen as well. I'll also mention it, again, with the adoptee's permission, if it is relevant to the discussions. Um, if it's not relevant to discussions, then I won't mention it. But at some stage, the whole story does need to be revealed. And this is where I might give a brief introduction and say, I think it's very important that Jane tells you her own story in her own words. Do you mind if I ask her to send you a message and I can pass it on uh, through Ancestry's messaging system? Or if you're happy for me to, to give me your, your email address, I'll get Jane to email you directly.
So that's where a, a lot of um, discussion and negotiation happens. Um, and in my experience, the adoptee takes over the main part of the correspondence at this stage, and I step back and I just become the technical support in the background. And the distant cousin then becomes the middleman between the adoptee and her potentially close family. So where do you find close family members? Again, if they're not in your DNA matches, you can actually ask more distant DNA matches to put you in touch. Are you in touch with those cousins? It'd be great to get in touch with them, and you're hoping the person will say, well, I could probably call them for you. Oh, that would be great. Uh, ultimately, you'll say, can you put me in touch with the people that I want to get in touch with? Um, you can also do a tree search on Ancestry and find relatives who are researching the same family but who may not have had a DNA test. But if you've built the tree out and you found the common ancestor and you're tracing down, anybody researching that same family tree might be a half-sibling or a first cousin. So that's another way of finding close family members. Then you make cautious inquiries. Then you prepare a brief report or summary of the DNA. And to do that, the Watto tool is very, very helpful. Uh, this is also is on Johnny's uh, DNA Painter website. You can see here, I've uh, put in the family tree. I've put in, uh, we know that these are known relationships. Um, this is a 479, this is 900, this is 547. And then I can put in my adoptee at various places as hypothetical placements in the family tree. And the program automatically calculates which are the highest odds. And you can see here, this says a score of 79. Everything else here is 1, and all the red ones are 0. So this hypothesis 1 is 79 times more likely to be the true configuration than any other possible configuration I've put in. So it's a very useful way of summarizing all of the data on a single page. So the next thing you can do <clears throat> is ask these close family members if they personally know the potential birth family for more information on people in modern times. It helps you eliminate non-contenders and uh, they can also make inquiries on your behalf and become this liaison or middleman. So it's very important to engage them in your quest and work on building a trusting relationship. You need an ally on the inside because ultimately you will be asking people within the target family to do a DNA test. So that brings us to conf confirming that you found the right fa family by doing this targeted testing. Uh, there's three stages. You eliminate non-contenders, you identify your prime candidates, and then you approach them and ask for their DNA. Eliminating non-contenders. If you know the birth mother already, then you only need to identify the birth father. So all the female offspring of your common ancestors can be eliminated from further consideration. Any offspring who died in childbearing, in child, um, in, before childbearing age, they're not going to be parents. So they can be eliminated as well. If the offspring died before the adoptee was conceived, then they can be eliminated as well. If the offspring were abroad or elsewhere at the time of the conception, they can be relatively safely discarded as candidates unless they came back for holidays and were having a fling. Um, if any offspring that was not in the right place at the right time goes down uh, on the candidate list and not at the top of the candidate list. Then you'll need to um, approach the, the possible close family and ask them to do DNA testing. This means biting the bullet. You could open a, a can of worms. It could be Pandora's box, because you never know the circumstances of the family that you are stepping into. So you have to be really, really careful. You have to manage expectations on both sides. You have to manage your own expectations as an adoptee, and you have to manage expectations on the on potential birth family side as well. So many times, the adoptees I'm working with, when I say, we found your grandparents, one of these people is your birth parent, they start bouncing off the walls, and I'm running around to try and contain them. The excitement is palpable, and it's very important to try and keep it calm and keep it contained. You also need to allow the birth family time to digest this information, time to discuss it amongst themselves, and time to negotiate with each other about who's going to do the DNA test. Uh, eventually, the close family does the test. The long wait for the results is completely nerve-wracking. Your nerves will be shred. 
It either confirms or it refutes the theory that you're related, and unexpected twists will happen. So you do have to be prepared. If it is positive, what do you do then? Well, then there's a reconnection. And this is an emotional roller coaster on both sides of the family. Now, you saw uh, Winnie earlier on. She had a beautiful emotional uh, reconnection with her family, and they welcomed in her into their arms with open hearts, um, and uh, she had a wonderful time reconnecting with them. Um, and even at uh, family gatherings, distant cousins will come up to her and say, what you did just reminds me of your mother. Oh my God, your resemblance is incredible. The beautiful thing about this family is they said they felt they were getting part of their mother back because their mother had passed away 10 years previously. So when Winnie, their older sister, um, came on, then they felt that they were actually getting uh, part of their mother back. You do, if you have a support, you do need a support network. And if you have been in touch previously with a social worker, now is a good time to reactivate that connection because they can put you in touch with counselors. Um, and they can also help you tracing modern people and living, and living people in modern times. So do reconnect with your social worker if you've had one. Always set your expectations at low to medium. Be patient. This takes a long time to work through. Be kind to other people. Be kind to your matches. Be kind to your potential birth family. And be kind to yourself. Take time to build a relationship with your birth family. It's not just a case of, oh, hi, we're related, I'm your half-sister, and then there isn't any plan for building the relationship. And a lot of the time, even though the initial uh, connection is positive, uh, two years down the line, they're just sending each other Christmas cards, and there's no real relationship there. You need to take a break from all this as well. And uh, in Winnie's case, I said, you know, I gave her six months to reconnect with her the mother's side of the family. And then I said to her, what about your father's side? Would you like to start looking for your father's side? Now, she said, you know what? I'm putting everything on hold for 12 months. I need a break and I need to get on with my life because my life has been on hold while all of this has been going on. So she took a break for 12 months and then it took us a year after that and we located her father. So that's the step-by-step -step approach. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through um, what I use in my work, which is the Adoptee Worksheet uh, Template. And this is just an Excel spreadsheet that I use to put in a whole load of information from a variety of different sources, all in the one place, um, from multiple companies, 23andMe, Ancestry, and so on. And to illustrate this, I'm going to tell you Peter's story. He was born in 1944, raised in a children's home, met his birth mother in 1975, and never knew who his father was. So he did his DNA, and we were able to isolate uh, shared, clusters of shared matches on his father's side because a maternal first cousin had tested. Anybody who matched Peter and his maternal first cousin had to be on the paternal side. They were eliminated. We looked at those remaining matches. They had to be on the mother's side, on the father's side, rather. And there were two clusters, the yellow cluster and the orange cluster. And you can see I've put in a, an ID letter, uh, the company they tested with, most from Ancestry, uh, three of them from Family Tree DNA, total amount of shared centimorgans, the possible relationship based on the sh shared centimorgans, and then the shared matches. And you can see that A, C, E, K, and P were one group in the yellow group, and then the orange group was BDF, GHIMOP, and most of them matched uh, each other. Some of them just matched one person within the group. So there was a core group within each cluster, and then some peripheral. And you can see that some people had family trees, 178 people, 2,000 people, some people had nobody there at all. The orange cluster, the, here we have the ancestors on the left, and these are the DNA testees on the right from the various companies, uh, well, as long, along with the centimorgans uh, included, and then parents, grandparents, great parents, great great, great great great, and so on. The, 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 these people had ancestors called Greeley, Grealish, and Duggan, uh, but a single common ancestor for the entire group could not be identified. And this is going to confuse the, the picture because, well, a lot of them appear to have double connections. Greeley's marrying each other up here, uh, Greeley and Greeley down here. So that meant that descendants were getting more DNA than average. And so maybe the actual connection was a generation further back. 
So the yellow cluster then went back to um, ancestors called Brown. Um, you see up here George Brown and Mary Mulroney. A single common ancestor, though, could not be identified because some people hadn't supplied their family trees. But the name Brown rang a bell with Peter. His, so we, research, uh, we switched our research to a specific Mr. Brown, who was a neighbor of Peter's mother, and he cared for her during her confinement. Now, there was a smoking gun. So we turned our attention to this specific Mr. Brown, and lo and behold, on his father's side, he went back to George Brown and Mary Mulroney of the Yellow Cluster, and on his, oh, that's on his father's side. On his mother's side, his grandparents were called Greeley and Duggan, two of the surnames that appeared in the Orange Cluster. Um, we then asked the question, is there anyone that we can test in the larger family to prove the connection? And we actually found a first cousin to Mr. Brown, Jane, born in 1935. There was a 40-year difference between the two. Um, Jane would have been a first cousin once removed to Peter. And the average amount of DNA shared for first cousins once removed is 440 centimorgans. Uh, Jane kindly did a DNA test, and it came back as 427 centimorgans. So now if we look at the final spreadsheet for, for Peter. We can see we have an established second cousin once removed link um, on the, in the yellow cluster, and on the green cluster, we have a first cousin once removed. Um, we still don't know the exact relationship of a lot of people uh, in the, in the uh, orange cluster, any people in the orange cluster, and there's several people in the yellow cluster where we don't know the um, identification uh, for sure. But that gives you an idea of what happens in practice. Now, this is my last slide. Peter did not do the DNA test to find his father. DNA, Peter did the DNA test to find his sister. His sister and himself were raised in the children's home. He only found out about his sister about five years ago when they found her birth certificate. Uh, she was raised, along with Peter, in the Chewham children's home in Galway. Now, there was uh, a possibility that the death certificate had been forged and that his sister had been sold to an American couple back in the 1950s. He wanted to see if his sister was in the databases. That's why he did the DNA test. As an offshoot, he was able to find his father. In the next couple of years, this uh, children's home is going to be excavated because there's a pit with the remains of some 800 children in that pit. And it may very well be that the genetic genealogy techniques that we've used to help Peter identify his father will also be used to help to identify the remains of the children in the pit at the former children's home in Chum. And this just goes to show you how powerful this tool can be, not just for us doing adoptee and foundling research, but for um, any mass grave situation, whether it's a World War I soldier on the Western Front, whether it is a child uh, in a disused pit in a children's home, whether it's a, a man-made or natural disaster like the World Trade Center, um, the well of California wildfires, it's a very, uh, whether it's to detach serial killers and, or identify human remains. So it's a really, really powerful tool. It's a, it's a very, very straightforward technique. It takes a lot of time and effort, but hopefully you've got a better idea of what's involved. And I wish you all the best of luck in your own research. Thank you very, very much for your attention. <clears throat> Now, we probably have time for one or two questions, and I'm just wondering if there's any... Rachel, could you possibly um, take the microphone, if there are any questions? Does anybody have any questions at all? Any questions? Because if not, I'm going to give you a comfort break. <laughs> Anything? No? Fine. Well, I'll li oh, there's one question here, if you just pass that down to that lady. Oh, that... There's another here. Mm. Sorry, I will turn it up. It's, it's over here. I'll shout. <laughs> hello, hello. It's, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm helping a lady who's in her 70s, whose father, all she knows about her father was he, uh, he was a Canadian serviceman. 
and we've done the DNA tests um, and the closest matches that she's come up with on the paternal side potentially, because the closer ones we've identified as maternal, uh, are fourth cousins or more, fourth to sixth cousins. Um, there are some clusters, but... In, in reality, what's the likelihood of actually being able to identify that as a potential parent, father? If, it, if it's a fourth cousin, then you're going back to your great-great-great-grandparents. How old is the lady? In She's in her 70s. She's in her 70s, so great-great-great-grandparents for her would be born around about 1750. <laughs> yeah. You know, so the records are going to be relatively sparse, especially if she's Canadian as well. Well, he, he, he her father Canadian. was Canadian. It was a World War II, you know, liaison in the in London. Have so. you transferred her data to all of the other companies? No, only to my heritage. We did it with Ancestry, and we've transferred it to my right. heritage, but haven't done the others. So do family tree DNA, do jet match, and do living DNA as well, okay. because you never know in which pool the big fish is going to be swimming. Right. But you're really hoping for a close match to join the database at some point in time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. And there's a lady here in green. Hello. Um, I'm just trying to find my great-grandmother. We have no records of her birth at all. Is that going to be too far back, or should I no, get my parents? No, great-grandmother should be fine. Um, again, you'll have to use this technique to isolate um, the various uh, groups. In fact, the slides that I showed, you get rid of great-grandparent couple one matches, great-grandparent number two matches, great-grandparent number three matches. Then you're left with the great-grandfather you do know and the great-grandmother you don't know. You don't know... You know the great-grandfather, but you don't know the great-grandmother. So then if you can actually go back up a generation on the great-grandfather's side and find somebody to test on his side, then that way you'll be able to further narrow down and eliminate non-contenders from the group, from the matches you have left. Um, and you will have to use the clustering to try and get back. But it is feasible. It's feasible. You're just about at the limit. Just about at the limit. We probably have, we have to uh, call it a day there, unfortunately, because we have the um, uh, panel discussion happening shortly. So it gives you six minutes to um, have a little comfort break, but I can answer your question um, over here. Thanks very much.